You see that last breath that he took when he did that horn? <laughs> it's good. It's good to be with you. Thank you, Brother Mark and Faith Baptist for allowing us to come. And it's been, I think, since 2009 that I was here last. They just finished the building, and, and uh, Bio was trying to complete their building down the way there. And appreciate the ministry of Bio. Got to meet Brother Brother Vic years ago, Miss Joyce, when she's still living, and uh, way back when. And, began to pray for the ministry during that time and got to meet um, Johannes Katena. And uh, at that time he was single and he had just graduated. We, got to, we actually went to his graduation at Crown College. He graduated at the same time, I think, that our youngest daughter Stacy did. And uh, he got an ovation from the people from the audience, you know, and it was a big thing for, for him to graduate. And uh, Brother Vic had was a speaker at one of the conferences. Brother David set up a missionaries conference and I happened to be home on furlough at that time. And, and uh, Johannes came, uh, his, his mother, his sister, and there was another missionary from Mexico. And uh, uh, the, the Brockways, the yeah, Brockways, they were, they were here. I was telling Brother Mark about it in a little bit. And so they put us out in the hotel and um, <clears throat> and got to meet this, this fine family from Ethiopia originally, I think, and then never going to, to uh, Zambia. And uh, Johannes and I had to stay in the same room. We didn't say have to stay in the same room, but it was convenient to stay in the same room. So, um, and then his sister and his mother stayed in another room. Of course, Norm and Pat stayed in, in their room. And uh, during the night, I didn't get a lot of sleep during that conference because um, Johannes snores terribly. <laughs> I said, what is that noise? You know, it's Johannes story. And he'd wake up, and he'd say, oh, Pastor, forgive me. You know, I'm so sorry. You know, I said, don't worry. I sleep good, you know. <laughs> but Mimi, uh, Mimi was, when she came, they were doing uh, physical exams and so forth to make sure they didn't have AIDS. You know, the country was known for having a lot of AIDS. They checked them out physically. They were doing good. They were visiting churches, especially here in the South Tennessee. And uh, during that time, uh, at the conference and everything, they were traveling one place to the other, and she said, what is that horrible smell? And, uh, and Brother Vic said, so this, well, I guess it must be skunks. She said, does all of America smell like that? <laughs> <laughs> so what an introduction from a foreigner to come to our land to smell skunks, you know, pole cat. How many of you call them pole cats? Some of you still do. How many know what a pole cat is? It's a skunk, okay. <laughs> uh, so much. We'd like to tell you that uh, what you've been involved in these 35 years. Um, a lot of challenges, a lot of barriers and walls. We knew they'd be that. We'd already seen that in 13 years of ministry before we went to the mission field. Um, God called me to preach when I was 17 years old. And uh, I didn't know if God wanted me to be a pastor or, you know, I knew there was pastors and knew there were missionaries because our pastor in Virginia, where my dad was stationed, my dad was military, and so... Um, I was called to preach in a little church up in Virginia, and um, didn't, we had a lot of missionaries who came in and got to see missionaries, real life, honest goodness, missionaries, you know, first time in my life. And I, you know, I just, I guess God was, as, as I look back in your time, and God's always been speaking to my heart about things. He, he, he spoke to me about preaching the gospel. It was a big order, and I didn't, I didn't want to. Just say, yeah, I'm called to preach. Feel like I'm called to preach, and then go do it. And God's not called me. I want Him to show me, and He did. Uh, it's not one of those things. I, I said, God, you've got to show me from the Scriptures. You want me to preach? And I said, You burden my heart for souls and to get the message, the gospel, to people. And, and but I need to know from you, from your Word. And so I went home, sat on the edge of my bed, and randomly opened my Bible. This is not the way you find God's will all the time, okay? But God did it for me, and. Opened it up, fell to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and it was right there. Preach the word, be instant in season. And it was just special from God, and I knew it. I knew he confirmed it. I didn't know if I wanted to be a missionary or a pastor, an evangelist. And uh, so my pastor said, well, when I announced it, he told the church, you know, and he let me preach my first message. Uh, I was one of those preachers, you know, you prepare 45 an hour. 45 minutes to an hour thing, and I preached that 45 minutes to an hour, and the pastor was surprised. He used his five minutes, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, you need to go to Bible college. And I said, what's that? And uh, he told me it was different ones, you know, and that were the proper ones people were going to. And so I said, uh, he mentioned Tennessee Temple. And I said, yeah. 
that sounds good. I was born in Tennessee and prayed about it. was accepted, went to Tennessee Temple in uh, 1968, or 69, excuse me, 69. Stayed uh, four years and all the summers, went to summer school, met my wife, Rhonda, in our, my third year, my junior year. And uh, still had no idea if God was calling me to be a pastor or what. But during those, those, those years, the uh, missionaries' conferences were some of the highlights of the, our school year, or the church year and the school year. And, man, missionaries came from everywhere. And as I look back, I see how many missionaries and people, of servants of God that he used in my life to call me to, to be his missionary. And I, those missionaries would come, and I'd feel a burden for every one of those fields. Said, Somebody needs to go there. Somebody needs to. I began to pray for, for laborers that God would raise up people to go to those places. And, and, but had no thinking that maybe God wanted to use me as a missionary. And I was studying and studying hard, enjoying the studying and serving the Lord, involved in jail ministry, radio ministry, filling pulpits, and not, a, not an idea that God would ever call me to be a missionary. But God used one missionary during that conference one of the conferences, and he stuck his finger out across the pulpit and student body. He says, is it slightly possible that God is calling you to be a missionary? And I could not get away from that bony finger. <clears throat> and I said, you know, we've been learning about the will of God and, and, and the Lord being Lord of our lives. He's Lord of your life. He's your Savior. He is your Lord. And we hadn't got into that teaching, you know, the Lordship salvation in those years, but yet I understood what being Lord, Master, Owner of, of my life was, and I wasn't giving God all the, all the property. And so I answered the question. I went forward. I filled out a car and said, God, if you want me to be a missionary, I'm yours. And I left it with him. Graduated. Ron and I were married in Jacksonville, Florida, serving a little church there about a year and a half, almost two years, and um, felt a burden, um, a holy nudge from the Holy Spirit to come back to Tennessee a candidate for churches, felt like God wanted me to be a pastor. And uh, did take a church, took a mountain church in Coke Creek, Tennessee. It's the same mountain range that runs between where we live now in North Carolina and, and uh, Tennessee. And uh, mountain church is, is a foreign mission field. And they speak another language, have other ideas. I lasted about nine months, <clears throat> 25-year-old. Want to make a lot of changes, good changes, but they were not ready for changes. And so to stay would have split the church, so we left and we went to Athens, Tennessee, where we felt like we could at least find some direction from God, uh, kind of linked into the Fairview Baptist Church, and um, just God show us this beginning in our lives. We're living by faith, trusting you. We want you to give us clear direction. And during that time, the, we learned that they had in, inherited, I guess, a donation from a, a local farmer in that area who wanted to do something like Camp Joy in Chattanooga and start a, a junior boy and grow a youth camp, and he gave his whole farm to the church. And it was during what they called the miracle year. And uh, they did a pilot week, you know, and with the camp and so forth, and then, uh, then the camp director the next summer, he resigned. He said, no more, I'm not going to do this anymore. And so the pastor came to us, and he said, uh, would you pray about um, becoming co-pastor of this church and, and, and uh, being the camp director? And I said, I don't need to pray about it. I said, God has burdened our hearts for youth and young people. And it was there I wanted to preach, but yet we knew that young people had to be reached, next generations. And God just opened the door like that, and we stayed there 10 years, and I was there to stay. I told pastors, we're here to stay. This is God's will, and had a great time just uh, winning souls, getting every aspect, as I said this morning, every aspect of the ministry, bus ministry, the, the Christian school, when it started, we were involved in that, uh, visitation, chairman. I mean, whatever it was to do, we, we, were, we were involved in it. But camp ministry was the focus. And uh, but then God put that holy nudge again. And uh, missionaries came to our church, and one missionary in particular uh, came, and he, he preached his message, and he showed his slides. And I didn't feel a burden for where he was in, in Mexico. I didn't feel a burden for Mexico. But I knew that God was using that man to speak through that message to my heart about that commitment that I made 13 years earlier. And so I went forward. It was Mother's Day. Rhonda did the same thing. Didn't realize she'd gone forward. We surrendered to be missionaries to God wherever he wanted, Mother's Day, 1984. And uh, first question that people wanted to know, where are you going? And we said, we don't know. And I said, that's 
what? You, you, you called a mission to, to be a missionary. I don't know where you're going. Says, that's with God. God's, we're called to God, and God will put us where we're, where we're needed. So long story, we began to search for mission agencies, and uh, God, again, miraculously began to use people, missionaries, others, servants of God to direct us. Um, Baptist Men Missions reached out, and they're the missions that uh, accepted us. We saw them before they saw us, and we went to candidate school before they ever accepted as missionaries. And we got to see Baptist Men Missions. And then they looked at us, and then um, and we did all that doctrinal examinations and medical form. Man, was, I said, man, I thought it was easy being a missionary, you know. And so they accepted us in <laughs> November 1984. Now, this is Mother's Day 1984, and we were accepted by Baptist Mission in November 1984. We were given permission to go on the road to be to be missionaries on deputation. And as I said this morning, we'd heard stories four and five years to raise your money to go to the mission field. I said, man, whatever it takes, Lord, you've called us, you're able to help us, and we know that you're in this. And so we packed our car up, began to get on the telephone, a little black thing with a cord that runs sticks to the wall, <laughs> and hundreds of phone calls and letters to hundreds of pastors. And through the years, met many pastors and youth pastors, and by that, God gave us open doors to be able to get into many churches. Our church kept us on salary while we were in our first uh, months of our, our deputation. That allowed us to go full-time, full-time. And again, that's a God thing. Uh, we, were, we traveled 55,000 miles. We're out two cars, a car wrecked, and various other problems that we ran into, a health problem with our older daughter, and... Yet we knew God had called us, and he knew he was testing us. And uh, we drove 55,000 miles, visited 137 churches in a year and a half. Now, you calculate. Um, any math mathematicians in here? I said, is that possible? <laughs> we showed the film Amazon Waits 137 times and in four Christian schools. And trying to build that team of people that would go to the Amazon with us and pray for us. When we were through, we had 52 churches, 110% support, and a year and a half, really actually two years, we got approval from Brazil, and we were on the streets of Brazil, went there January 11th, 1987. Excited out of our heads, serving God in, in the will of God, and look back at the track record and see what God had done. Do we have something to tell the next generation? We're telling you tonight to this generation. That's what God can do, but we're not through yet, you know, so... We're on the streets of Brazil, excited out of our heads, and we can't do anything. We're frustrated. Why? Can't talk to them. 13 years of ministry, telling them about the gospel, discipleship, can't do anything. We're just like a kid, stranded, you know. And so we started the language school. What's the language? Portuguese. It's about as hard as Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> Not quite. But we knew that God had called us. He would help us. We have never seen so many verbs. They have a verb book in Brazil. It's that thick. I've seen it. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, and con con conjugations for every one of those. Even the infinitive has a conjugation. If you know what conjugations are, you know, the past, present, and future. But we knew that God had called us there. I was 36. Ron is 34. Um, she's homeschooling. It's a little harder for her. Housewife, mother, missionary, trying to learn a language. 34 years old. But yet God helped us. We began that, get involved with a little congregation there, uh, just starting up in a little slum, slum area of Brazil in Manaus. Manaus at this time, about a million and a half people. And uh, one of our single missionaries said, there's a little work starting up that I'm working in. You guys come help us. I think they helped us more than we helped them. But we got involved and in not understanding a word that people are saying. We're starting to learn some words. But you know, can you imagine sitting six months in a little church and not understanding the guy who's preaching up front? Um, I know you think, brother, you still I can't understand Brother Mark, right? <laughs> Finally, after six months, hey, I understood a, a phrase. I understood a pair. I, yeah. Then we began to do your first Sunday school lesson in Portuguese. Then you preach your first message. And then first vacation Bible school. And we got involved in the Rwanda program. Couldn't, couldn't talk to the kids, but I could show them how to do the games and mystery to interpret, you know, and our kids, our kids, our three kids saying, Dad, how long we got to do this? <laughs> We're doing this forever. And we got attached to that congregation and began to grow there. We saw our first three souls saved there, three girls led to Christ, and then God put on our hearts to do survey work. We began to look around 
God wants to work with the Indian tribes or a lot of places. When we looked at the Amazon, if you've seen the map out there, it's, it's huge. It just half the country of Brazil is the Amazon region. And Brazil's bigger than the continental United States. And he said, where, God, do you want us in this huge country? So we prayed and went and began to see with our eyes, feel that holy nudge again. And uh, we went to a town called Santarém Pará, it's the second largest state in, in Brazil, the north region, 500 miles downriver from Manaus. Uh, we met a, a veteran missionary who had, had his eye on the city, and he had, he had a boat minister, and he said, this is where I stopped on the other side of the river. And he says, I think we need to make other churches in bigger cities. And he said, maybe you part, you're part of that vision. So we went there. We spent three days, and we felt God wanted us in Santarém Pará. We went there in August 7th. And eighth, I came in, 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 in I don't say top is in Portuguese, in phases. I came first, came down river with all our furniture on the boat and uh, unloaded it. And time Rod and them flew in on the airplane there at the airport, picked them up. And uh, we were in something that ain't excited out of our heads that God's where God wanted us. And he said, what do you do now? How do you do this, Lord? And we began to go out in the neighborhood and begin to see the needs. You know, very, very poor people. Um, it's a, a town about 180,000 at this time in 1988, 1988. So we went there and we began just to meet the people and, and tell them why we were there, invite them to come to Bible study in our home. They're very reluctant to come to our house, the American's house. But eventually we ended up with three couples coming. And eventually they grew that first work, 40 people on our back porch. And we began to grow in need of land. And so we bought land and we started our first building. And then we came home on our first furlough. And um, then we went back again, and uh, we helped to reestablish establish that church, get it organized, and get its first pastor. A young man, a young Brazilian fellow, came and answered the call, came and took the church for a couple of years. And um, then we, uh, we worked in the Olympics from 1996. Uh, remember the Medals for Glory program? Had, and we stayed home two years to work in that program to win souls in Atlanta, Georgia. And then we went back to the field again and, and, and got the church uh, stronger. And then we began to, to pray for, for laborers. We saw the great need for laborers. We saw not only Brazilian laborers, but we also saw an American missionary that, that was interested in there and came. He started the Victory Baptist Church in the year 2000. Off the first church, we started a congregation. The, the Brazilian missionary had uh, started uh, a work off of it. It was the Peniel Baptist Church. It started in 1998. So 2000, the Victory Baptist Church started. And God uh, raised up another missionary, a Brazilian missionary, started to work across town. And they called it the Independent Baptist Church. 2003, we began the, the Maranatha Baptist Church and uh, built the buildings, had them completed, and uh, began that ministry. We started a seven years. For seven years, we had a Bible institute. Uh, the other missionary and I began... That Bible Institute ran for seven years, had seven graduates, one, one went into pastorate. It helped our lay people a lot. Um, and then uh, our folks got up in age, started aging, and we had to consider whether or not we were going to come home for a period of time so we could determine whether Rhonda's parents were going to need uh, total care. And so it was determined that her mother needed total care, and so she became the caregiver. So we had to make a decision. Um, Baptist Missions let me go back. Uh, we came home in 2011, went back in 2013. I had to stay, I could stay eight months, come home, stay two months. We did that for four years. And her parents passed away off into glory, and Rhonda was able to rejoin me in, in 2017. And I'm telling all this because this is the past, okay? And it's, it's going somewhere, so don't get, don't get antsy. <laughs> During those uh, four years that we were, in a sense, separated, uh, we're thankful for communications, for internet. We got our first computer in 1995. The church donated a computer to us, and it took us four years to learn how to use it. And then by the time we learned how to use it, they changed everything. So <laughs> you know how that is. But that, that was a blessing to be able to communicate uh, through, through the internet, and God had changed things, you know, and, and the but when we went back, when I went back in 2013, the last of our pastors, we have these four churches that we were totally involved in. The last of our pastors resigned and went back south, took a, took a co-pastor position there in the south. And so we have four churches now without pastors. So what do you do? And uh, so three of them, I was able to, to convince them that I could be their circuit-riding pastor. And uh, 
Uh, it worked well. We changed times. We changed a lot of things. But it brought those four churches into a, a fellowship and a unity that we've never seen. Uh, the lay people got off the bench. They began to do the work that we were doing. The fourth church uh, didn't have to pastor. They had enough men, laymen in the church that were able to do that. Uh, I had to close the Bible, Bible school, the Bible institute, because of any teachers. And so we, we were sad about that. But uh, So the churches are, are moving along. We finally, in these last few years, kind of bring you more up to present. And these have got a couple of pastors. One of our, our teenagers went to seminary and moved off a, a few years, came back, took the Victory Church. Uh, Pastor Josie Ma came. We've written about him in the letter. Came and took the Maranatha Church. He almost made three years. And he went back to Boa Vista near Venezuela, is pastoring there. All of them are in the ministry. Uh, so now we're back to uh, with, with uh, the uh, three churches without pastors. And won't you really pray that God would, would raise up good men of God, good men of God. Yes, pray specifically, good men of God that don't know what it means to quit. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's not an low, low, area of low-hanging fruit. There's fruit there. We had very fruitful ministries in the beginning, but through the years, things have changed. But it's difficult to get them to come into that area. They get discouraged quickly, and they leave us, and it's a sad time for us. And um, so we, uh, this, we have a team of uh, three pastors, and the first pastor that we got, Pastor Hubins, we've written to you folks about him quite some time uh, in, the, in the past, uh, is coming back. And he wants to come back to Santa Fe, and he's going to take the Maranatha Church. And his son-in-law is going to take the Bella Vista Church, our first church plant. And there's another young man working with him. I don't know if he's a young man or not. He's, he's more middle-aged, and uh, him and his wife are coming on to take the Peniel Church. The Peniel Church is one of our most needy churches as far as the physical plant and also the structure of the church. Um, the sheep need a lot of help. We were able to maintain that during those times, been passing those churches almost eight years. And finally, God has blessed us with some good leaders. And so in January, more or less January, those pastors are coming, and so that's, a, that's an answer to prayer. So that kind of kind of gives you, a, and there's a lot of lot of water down the Amazon between all these little little things I'm telling you. But that brings me to the to the present also to tell you that we're reporting to all our churches. We have 41 supporting churches, and uh, we're almost through visiting those. Some of them are helping us out, giving us the meetings, and we're thankful for Faith Baptist Brother Mark Lyons to come and have this time. Uh, future. Baptist, I turned 71 in uh, January. I know it's hard to believe. I turned, <laughs> it's difficult, I know, but I turned 71 in, in January. Baptist Men Missions, like many other missions, has a mandatory retirement at 70. You, know, you work for this and you labor and you said suddenly, you know, uh, we have to leave and we're not ready to leave, you know. But it's, it helps in the sense of IRS. We're just... We're, we're dis, dis, trying to think in Portuguese and English, we're dismembering in a sense, retiring from Baptist Mid Missions officially in March, and uh, we still want to continue to go to Brazil and edify and exhort and fill in and projects. There's a, there's a ton of work still that needs to be done, and we're not ready to retire. And so it's a new beginning for us. We're not in church planning, but yet we're, we, we see that needed ministry and have seen it for years so we can be a help to those people. And we just finished a project putting a brand new roof and ceiling on, the, on our first church plant after 32 years, need a new roof, and finally got their first ceiling in. And they're excited. God helped us raise $6,000 to match another $6,000 for, for a fund that was uh, created for it. And so we were able to complete that project without even being in Brazil. And that was a blessing. So God is answering some prayers. Uh, we have bought into a little place on the other side of the mountain from Marvel. You, you got to say that right, you know. We keep going through Maryville, You got to talk right. So, Maryville is is the side Tennessee. You know where that is. You go up the Dragon Tail 129, and that's where we're living. Our daughter Stacy lives there with her family, and uh, God just blessed us with a place uh, out of our imagination. We never had a place before, and but we still want to continue to go to Brazil. I want you to understand that, and and the church can can decide what you want to do with us, and uh, we we want to continue to. Encourage churches if they want to support us. That's great. They want to do support. Uh, that's fine. If you don't want to support us, give it to somebody else. That's not going to hurt our feelings. We understand. But you pray about it. I know your, your leaders and missionary team will, will, will direct you on that. So that's, that's our plans, and that's our, the future that uh, we laid out for you, the past, present, and future. 
and we're thankful that you've been working with us in these many, many years to be able to do what we've done. And to, we have to say it's all been to the glory of God. And uh, he's the one that's given us the strength. Do we have anything to tell you about uh, the marvels of God? Yes. Yes. It's, God has helped us in every aspect of that work. And have there been any doubts? Tons of them. Have there been any barriers? A lot. Has the devil fought us? Yes. Did we have difficulties in the, with the government and the re religions that are the false religions that are? Yes. We still have problems with them. God's still a great God. And God is still helping. And we're thankful for the people that God has raised up to fill our shoes to do the work that we've been doing. And uh, we, uh, we want to continue to be part of that. And uh, we want, I want to share with you just for a moment, Brother Mark, you said uh, to, to finish this, what, 8 o'clock? Somewhere around there, you know. <laughs> I want you to look with me in the book of Luke, chapter 5 tied this in. You sang a song tonight. Actually, we were out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, reporting one of our churches there, and um, and uh, <clears throat> pastor gave me the, the Sunday school, and it was great. You know, we hadn't been out there in a long while, and gave me the message, you know, and, and I got the hymn book out, and I turned it to Rescue the Perishing, and I preached out of the hymn book, and people said, well, that's different, you know, and if you get time, go back and look at it. This morning I mentioned the fact that we are involved as, as children of God, as the church, born-again believers, every believer involved, every person. Missions is about, it's the heartbeat of God. God wants to see souls saved. He, he, he paid high price, high price to save the souls of men. And we're an ongoing perpetual rescue operation. We're involved in that. That's what the church is about, rescue. 911 is amazing. Falls right on this day, and you remember the story. Where were you at 911 when when it happened? Do you remember that? Can you can you fix your mind on it just for a moment? What was your reaction? First reaction? Is this a film? Is this a movie? Is this, you know you see so many of these things. New York's been attacked so many times by monsters and whatever, and this is real. We were in in something named Pará, and. Um, I was in a little project, building project or something in our first church and went to the lumber mill to get lumber and everything. And then the reaction of the Brazilians when they saw it, uh, we were shocked too. He says, how can this be happening? And, and the Brazilians said, why would anybody do that? Why would anybody do that? And you saw the aftermath. You saw the people, the, the rush, and you, and you see the Americans when there's a tragedy or a crisis, how they rush to, to be able to, to try to give some relief to try to get people's lives back to normal. The, the hurricanes, all the, the things that, that, that this country's been through and people have stood up and, and people have rushed and, and COVID. He said, well, that wasn't such a disaster as hurricanes and people running into our, our skyscrapers in New York, but yet it was a disaster, it was a worldwide thing. And, and the, the first responders stepped up again. And some of you probably are here involved in, in being a first responder. I began to pray for them more more fervently, the police, the fire, the, 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 the medical techs and doctors and hospitals and not just for COVID, but can you imagine in Hamlin County and in the connecting counties and, uh, uh, of, of this area that you live in, how many thousands of dollars are spent just in rescuing the perishing? And some of them don't deserve it. Oh, yeah? I mean, that's our normal natural... You know, somebody there's like rescuing the same people all the time. You know, in Jacksonville, Florida, we could see the ambulance come. We knew it well, was a drug overdose on the street. You know, the same people. Kind of Abraham and Lot. Abraham was always rescuing Lot. We'll always be rescuing those who are the ones who are the straying sheep. But we're not to judge motive. We're human beings. We will. We'll, we'll criticize. And we're not to judge the motive. We're involved in, in, in having the heart of God of, of reaching out to people who don't want the gospel. They don't want it. Leave me alone. I'm very smugly happy in my life the way I am. C.S. Lewis made a statement. I wrote it down just here recently, you know, starting to read some of his writings over the years. years some of them just kind of, you know, you have to stop and think about them a little bit. You know, he says, what we all really want what we all really want is the happy past restored. Think about it. 
it's just that society, humans are going about the wrong way of trying to find that happiness or that trying to find that meaning for their life. And, and they try all in the wrong, and the song was written, you know, and trying to find happiness and fulfillment in all the wrong places and all the wrong things. And we have the answer. We have the answer. And they don't want to hear it, some of them, but they're, but it's the sowing of the seed again on those different kinds of grounds, folks. Those hearts that Jesus, and that message he gave to his disciples and those listening, he, he said, these are the kinds of hearts, and he might be the same person going through different phases in their life. The sowing of the gospel, the, 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 the sower didn't use any kind of discretion. Certainly you want to sow on good ground, but that seed went different places. And it had different effects because of the condition of the heart. We're not called to judge the condition of the heart. We're called to preach the gospel, sow the gospel, give the word of God out. Through the living of, our, living of the truth in our lives, live it out in our lives. That's your sowing. People see your life more than hear your words. If you're a young person or middle-aged or old, as they call it, there's a little, they have a kids' ministry in Victory Baptist Church in Jacksonville, and Rhonda took part during those four years in that church and working with those kids and running uh, Patch Kids, they called it. Is that it? Patch Pirate, yeah. And I was happened to be home on those two, two months short furloughs and everything, and I went back there to see what was going on, and, and this little black boy had gotten off one of the vans and everything, and he came in the hall, and he, said, he looked at me, and he said, You're old. <laughs> I said, if you see an old man in this, in this hall, give him $200. And he turned around and went away. <laughs> Stopped him short. You might be old, but the, the sower has good seed, and the sower is the son of man. It's us, too. We're sowing with him. And we don't know what soil we're sowing. We've seen that over and over and over again in Brazil. We saw it in America. We saw it. We see it in Brazil. We don't know what, but we're there to sow the seed. God didn't, and guy, guy asked me on our podcast, he said, how many, how many souls he wanted to, to Jesus, Jim? I said, I don't know. We have, so, we have the fruit that's there. It shows souls have been saved and disciples. They're doing the work. I don't go counting how many souls we can come home with glory and report. We had thousands of people saved. I don't think y'all do that. God knows. It's for His glory. God sent me there for one purpose. Preach the truth. Shine the light. Be real. Live it. Not just say it, just preach it, but live it. That's your soul and that's your giving. It's not just about the money. Yes, the money is important, but your life is that giving. So we're in a, we're in a perpetual rescue operation. And it, it, it requires that more people involved do doing, you doing your part, your capacity. Keeping your eyes open. Look on the fields for they are white already in the harvest, Jesus said, John chapter 4. White already means that, yes, it's to the point we're going to lose the harvest. Lose the harvest. You're in Luke chapter 5, I want to get to that, but this is interesting that the Coast Guard... I read this several places and everything, but it's interesting. They put out a, a, a statement on rescuing drowning individuals. This is typical. It's not always the case, but more, more, more likely than none, this is, this is generally what happens when the Coast Guard goes out to rescue somebody's drowning. Number one, they never, never cry out for help. You've seen that in movies, help! They've got both hands up waving their hand. You don't, you don't do that. You need those hands to keep afloat. They're in a panic. You, you go into panic mode. And panic's different. You, you lose your, your, your orientation. And they don't ever cry out for help. Secondly, it says they never raise their arms to signal that they're in distress. And they never see the life preserver or the, the life ring that is thrown to them. Or the lifeline. They never see it. And they usually don't recognize that someone is trying to save them. And they also will drown you if you go out to try to save them. I know that as a Boy Scout. <laughs> Life saving. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think because of what they just stated there that they're going to stop trying to rescue those drowning people? They're going to crank it up. Because folks don't want... It, that's typical of what we're trying to reach spiritually. Most people are not going to cry out for help until they're to the point where that they, they finally kill their pride and say, I need help. I can't do this. I need somebody's help. Sometimes I don't know who, realize who's, who's helping them. 
They don't recognize that you have the answer. You have the life preserver. You have what they're, they're looking for in all the wrong places. And they usually don't recognize the person that's trying to, trying to rescue them. But regardless, thousands and thousands of dollars spent in these adjoining counties to rescue people who are perishing and have needs. Why do they do that? You ever ask yourself that question? Why? Apparently, bodies, people, souls are important. So they do rescue them and get them back to some normality of their life, okay? And they're back now to their families if they, if they get to that point, and that's great. For what? To continue their life normally so they can live and eventually die and die without Christ. In analogy, we should spend every effort, the force, the capacities that God has given us, the monies to be able to try to rescue the perishing because their soul is what's important. What's important. And we need laborers. We need laborers. There's an initiative for Baptist Men Missions now, and it's called the... Um, 938, uh, pray 938. Matthew 938. The harvest is great, the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of harvest that he will raise up labors for his harvest. And even have a little bracelet. If you want one, there's, there's some out there we have for you, a little booklet that gives you a guide. But to, to pray that God will raise up other labors. What about young people? Have you seriously thought that slightly maybe God is calling you to be his servant in some capacity or the other have you given your life to him as your savior but yet also to say you are the owner of my life you have the right to tell me what you want with my life why i'm here why i'm here luke chapter 5 i'm not going to go through the whole story i like to preach the whole thing but i'm not going to do that <laughs> you said amen <laughs> it's a good it's a good story it's true it's, it's in the very beginning of the ministry of jesus and he's He's reaching out for the laborers. He prayed all night. And he called his disciples to him. Well, what a, what a band they are. Every walk of life. And, and it's interesting that, that the, the brothers and the team, the Zebedee team, his brother, Dr. Manley, talked about this morning. He talked about it a little bit, you know. And, and apparently, as you look at it, this family was pretty wealthy. And, and they had a pretty going business. They were prosperous businessmen. And that was a committed thing. And they would be fishermen all their lives. Their children would be fishermen on down the line. And he runs into another guy who's a tax clerk. That's a pre prestigious position, at least on his group's part in the Roman government, not necessarily on the Jewish part, but this man was, was a moneymaker. I mean, you know, he was using his head. Wealthy. And there was a whole group of them, these, these publicans. And so he, he had a prestigious position. But I want, I want to push down to the last, the last part of, 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 of uh, verse 10 and 11, and I'll kind of give you the, the recap of the story. It says in verse 10, and, and so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not from henceforth, from this time forth, thou shalt catch men. Catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. You've read that probably a dozen times. And the story is that, that Jesus saw that crowd following him, and he asked to borrow Peter's boat, very specifically Peter's boat, push out a little bit, and there was where they, they say in Portuguese at least, that's where the word pulpit came from, from, from the play on the words. It's interesting. The wind's carrying his voice, and he taught the people. And then all of a sudden, he's finished with the message, and he says, Peter, launch out in the deep. What were they doing before that? They had finished the day at early morning, more than likely. They'd been all night fishing, and they'd caught nothing, but they were mending their nets. They were washing their nets. They were on the shore. That's a finished task. They're not going to go back out. So that's a big thing for this preacher, this itinerant preacher, to ask the professional fisherman to jump back in his boat and go out. So one boat goes out with the nets, and there's Peter, and probably Andrew was in the boat with him, and they go out there, and he said, launch out into the deep, far out. 
And he says, cast out the nets. The nets. He says, but Lord, <clears throat> I know you're the educator and the preacher, and I respect you. He's not saying this, just what I'm, the way I'm seeing it. And he, and he said, but at, at thy word, I will cast out the net. So he throws the net in those huge, huge nets. And he had more thrown in the water, and the, the water's boiling, and, and hundreds of fish are in this net all of a sudden, where all night he's spent. And so he's over there, you know, and, and they, they stripped down when they went, when they went to, to fish and so forth. And you see Peter grabbing that net. Maybe Andrew's over there too, and he's pulling and tugging because the net's breaking now, and those fish, they're going to lose the biggest catch he's ever caught. I don't know if he got his cell phone out quickly, went over the calculator application. He said, look, man, this is, we're going to make a fortune today. He wasn't thinking that. He said, man, and he looks over the shore and he said, come help. It wasn't just him. No, come help, whistling and hollering, come help, come help. They came in the other boat and they rescued the fish. And when they got to the shore, before they got to the shore, Peter fell down in the, in, the, in the bottom of that boat, and he said, Lord, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. He suddenly realized, began to realize, suddenly began to realize who he is. This is the creator that knew where the fish were. Not only did he know where the fish were, he knows Peter. Dr. Manley talked about uh, God knowing us. C.H. Spurgeon said, the omniscience of God will give no comfort to the sinner. And probably to some backslidden Christians. You say, why is that? If God knows you, why are we pretending? Why do we pray with as if God didn't know what's in our heart? The omniscience of God will give you no comfort if you're not walking with him, if you're not right with him. He knows you. He knows Peter. He looks at him. He looks in his eyes and he's, he's bowed his head. And he, I realize now who you are later on in his confession. So here's what the statement is in verse 10. He says, Simon, and Simon means unstable, fear not. That's interesting. There's 365. I didn't count them all, but I went through quite a few of them in, in the Old and New Testament, the fear nots. There's 365, one for each day of the, of, of the year. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be a fright. You got any fears in your life right now? We all live with fears. Fear's good in a sense. You had that good part of the fear that keeps us out of trouble and says, you know, if I do this, what you know, I better not do that. That's the good part of fear. It protects us. But there's fears, things we don't understand, things we can't see, especially in the will of God, especially young people about your life. You said, I have no idea what I'm going to do in life. That could be a fear to you. But if your life is in control of the Savior, who is your Lord and owner, you can take that word to the bank, fear not. But he says, from this time forth, Peter, you're going to be a fisherman of men. Fisherman of men. You're going to win men. You're going to fish with the same passion. But what's even more amazing is this, is that when, he had brought their, when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all. Notice the words forsook all. And notice the words followed him. There's, there's at least two, three, three aspects of this that I think we ought to see here tonight. Before... Calming his heart, fear not, fret not, don't fear, Peter. You have to consider this is his will. He tells Peter his will. And now Peter has a choice. Those men have a choice. We all have a choice, and it comes with that one little thing that even a sinner has to do. They have to be willing to submit, surrender, to render their will to the will of God. That's where we, in the rescuing operation, we have to bring them to that point. Are you willing to submit your will to God's will? Abandon your sin and turn completely and totally to Jesus Christ to save you. Throwing yourself, being a dependent upon him. We see that what he's saying is here when he says they forsook all. 
the words indicate that you're leaving completely your former life. Wow. What are they? They're fishermen. Matthew, a tax collector, on down the line. One was a zealot. And then you also have this aspect that this deal forsook all is the realignment of your life in the, in the area of your loyalty. What are you going to be loyal to now? What's your passion now? We all have to come to that. When you surrender and say they forsook all, it means what it says. They left it. They, they left it. They abandoned it. Something known all their life. They left the nets and everything was Zebedee and Dr. Manning talking about the fact that more than likely gave the father, the father gave the blessing and everything. But to say, you're going off into what? To follow this man? They forsook all. It means leaving your com completely former life, put away, leave, yield up, surrender, complete severance in, in situations and in relationships. That's why it's so difficult for in the growing of, of young Christian, babe Christians, that they do not want to sever those relationships with their friends. And it's dragging them down. Dragging them down. But it means just that, severing completely. That's what they did. And it means realignment. Realignment and revitalization of your loyalty. What's your loyalty to now? Are, are you divided in your loyalty? That's a perverted faith. A perverted faith is whether you're loyal to this, you're trying to have two masters and follow two teachers in two ways. You can't do it. The Sermon on the Mount, he preached that. You can't do it. It's not possible. You're going to love one, hate the other, despise them even. Decide. Why halt you between two opinions? Decide. Choose this day. As far as me, Joshua said, me and my house would serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Realignment of your loyalty. When he said they forsook all, that little word all means all. You remember the story of the good, the, the, the rich young ruler? It's, uh, it's listed three times. Matthew 19, Mark 10, and, and Luke 18. It's good to see the parallels. This young man comes running, and apparently he received everything he had through inheritance. And that was common in those days. Passed away, the father, mother, and he inherited, became, he was young, he was, he was rich. But there was something that was missing in his life, and he came running. Mark says he came running to Jesus, and he bowed before him. He said, good master, what good thing must I do to have this eternal life, this message eternal life? And Jesus said, you know the commandments, and he listed all. And it's interesting, the commandments that he gave. Go through it in your study time. Look at look and, and get the number down. What, what he told him. And something, the orders changed it a little bit, but he, he talked about some things in there. He says, "Don't do this and don't do that." The Ten Commandments. He gave the moral law to him, but he didn't talk all of them. But they all had to do with the, the last six because they dealt dealt with his relationship on this level, his relationship and his situation on this level. He didn't talk about this. He called him good master, good teacher, and that's what wasn't right. If you really believe me to be a good master and a good teacher, you believe that I am God. But something's wrong here. And so he, he goes through and he said, but I've kept these. From, and I think he was sincere, folks. He was sincere that he had kept those from his youth. I, keep, I can keep those. But there's one missing that Jesus didn't quote to him. And Jesus said, one thing thou lackest. Man, if I was that young ruler, that's true. Bring it on. Tell me what it is. Quick, man. I'll, I'll do it with all my heart. And here it is. And you look at the order that he gave. He said, sell all that you have. What was the word? All? The Lord, can we negotiate that? Most of us are still negotiating in our lives. I want to keep this, and I want to hang on to this, and I want to have you, and I want this, this happiness that you're talking about and everything, but yet still I've got this, and I'm trying to find all my happiness in other areas plus you. Jesus said, sell all. It wasn't just that far. He said, give to the poor. Give to the poor. If, if the, the, the part of that, that divine law, folks, is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and body, and force, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, those go together. That's God, and that's the, the horizontal. If you love God in that fashion, 
you're going to love people here without any kind of wrong motive or respect to person. And you're going to try to do what God does for them. Give to the poor. He's not through. And then come follow me. In there is that, again, that submission, that desire. You must be willing to do this. And he said, well, let me think about it. No, he didn't say that. He said, in Portuguese, he says he was tristissimo. I like the Portuguese because they, they got words, man, just flamboyant and the color of that thing. He was super, super, so sad, dejected, depressed because of what Jesus said. That's what you've got to do to get eternal life. And so he went away. He made a decision. That was the Lord's will. He, choose, he chose not to do it. He walked away, so sad, dejected. And not even stranger, Jesus didn't go after him to try to convince him otherwise. He didn't really, well, I was a little hard. Those are hard words from Jesus, people. But his words are his words. And when he says, forsake, forsook all, they forsook all, and they went to follow him. And when he said, all prosperous business, prestigious positions, your lifeline, your livelihood, your comfort, security, your training, your possessions, relationships, your hopes. Jesus said it three times in the, in the book of Luke. He says, you cannot be my disciple except you do this. He said, you'll be willing to do what? Leave all, forsake all. Come follow me. Three times he told those people. No competition. No competition. Luke 18, real quick. This is what he said to the rich young ruler. This is his recording of of Luke's version here, but Jesus talked about the camel and going through the needle's eye, and they said, well, how difficult it is for someone to be saved. Jesus said, with God, nothing's impossible. And then Peter's reply in verse 27, in, 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 in verse 27 of 18, he said, he said, these things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Peter, in verse 28, then said, lo, look, when he said that, lo, there's a, there's a drama there. He said, look, our disciple, look, look at us, Lord. He has been looking down inside. Lo, behold, we have left all. Did you see that in Luke 5? We have left all. Our situation, our relationship, our loyalties to this, our comforts, the security, our hope. Our hope. In verse 29, he said unto them, look at this, Truly, verily, I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house. That's possessions. Parents, that's relationships. Brethren, wife, children, it's getting closer. For the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time. And in the world to come, life everlasting. We can say that as missionaries. So you let your flag, your family, your familiarities, you, you people sacrifice so much. No. We chose to forsake all. Come what may. And then in this aspect, folks, is, is that it was a test of our trust. Can I trust that God has called me? Can I trust that God is going to do what he is asking me to do? And I can 100% absolutely say all my heart that the character of God is behind every one of his promises I can trust in who God is and what he can do not just because we've been 35 years down the line but I believed that before we started the promises of God are backed up by his character he's there he's there when he says something he will, he will do it we could tell you young people, we could tell you you young couples, we could tell you as, as brethren in this church that have labored with us. God is real. God is good. God is good all the time. God is just. God is whole. He can't, he can't be cruel. He can't err. He can't err. He cannot. He cannot. He cannot lie. Believe the Bible. It's the powerful word of God. It changes lives. We've seen that in Brazil. It changed lives here in this impossibility you see right around here in America. And we just kind of throw up our hands and say, these people are impossible. 
They don't want God, just, just leave them alone. Let them go on to hell. And they followed him. That talks about unity of purpose and direction. There are, um, I'm trying to think Portuguese and English, um, these views. <laughs> there are distractions, there are side roads that Satan, and we have to realize, folks, that the battle that we're fighting and what we're seeing in America and what we're seeing in Brazil is not just about politics. It's not just about this, this social order. It's about the fact is that the satanic forces and Satan are behind it every bit. That's who we're fighting. We, we didn't go to the Brazil to fight the devil. We knew he's going to be there already. We went there to trust God, the character of God, to preach the powerful word of God that's doing the work, that's changing lives. We haven't won everybody. No. But we've gone to be faithful and to do what God told us to do with all our hearts. Have there been reverses? Have there been failures? Yes. But David never abandoned God in his life and all the things that he went through. You look at the Psalms and see the things that he wrote down about himself, his failures, his, heart, his heartaches, his fears. He wrote it all down for us. And God never forsook him. Because he never forsook God. God has never forsaken us. Dr. Manley talked more. He could be silent. Or his pastor was talking this morning about the silence of God. Alone. God is always with He lives within us. He's in us. So you look at the words. They, they seem simple. And they are simple. Let me leave with you this fact with these others reading the Bible serving God in the beginning uh, of my life growing as a Christian look for assurances from God and I found those assurances in the scriptures yes so I learned to, I had to love the scriptures and they gave me my strength they gave me the light that I needed the truth from my path. It's exactly what it says it is. Light of my path, you know, lamp into my feet and light into my path. God's opening my eyes, the psalmist said, Psalm 119, that I may behold the marvels, thy marvels. But I began to realize this, the business of faith, that it, I wanted all the answers, I wanted all the, the checks here to say, Lord, if you'll do this and you'll do this and you'll do this, then I will. What we have to understand, folks, you, you can prove it out. Any, anything that you read in Scripture is that God wants this. He wants first your obedience, and then he'll give you the understanding. It's there. Abraham gets you up, gets you out from your kindred, your country, to a place that I will show you. Later on, chapter 12, it says, and he went out. Hebrews 11, he went out not knowing where he was going. He forsook all. He didn't ask for the understanding. He trusted the character of God. And God led him to the promised land. Abraham considered the father of faith, he said. If you come to that rule in your life that we need to be obedient first when God speaks to your heart and you know it's God, be obedient immediately and with the right attitude and then it's interesting how the understanding comes the understanding comes may God bless you I hope you look at that in uh, the rich young ruler go back through it and put yourself in there by the way what was that commandment that Jesus called him on I thought you were going to get out of that one didn't you what was the commandment that Jesus got him on? Thou shalt not covet. Number 10. His comfort, his security, his hope, his passion was all wrapped up in his things. And Jesus nailed him on number 10. He said, I've kept all the others, but number 10. 
to covet your neighbor, your neighbor's servant, his wife, on down the line. And Satan says, hell, there's nothing in hell that's attractive that would attract anybody to go there. You ever think about that? Heaven, yeah, we talk about heaven, yeah. Is there anything attractive about hell that would want, make you want to go there? No, but Satan is clever. He makes the path to hell so beautiful. On your way. And we need to get the message to the rescue of the perishing that they are perishing. And they don't know when they're going to perish, when they're going to die. And that there is a judgment. God is a just judge. And there is a judgment. And Jesus Christ died on the cross to take your judgment. If you'll trust him wholly with your heart, he'll save your soul and he'll radically change your life. They forsook all and followed him. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for this time in your word. May it strike home, Father. May it bother us. May it be that holy nudge all week. Help us to come to conclusions in our life because of this these two messages, three messages, really, the Sunday school and the morning message and tonight. Consider that that message is for us. It's for me. And you need my verdict, my answer, response to your message. I pray that you'll touch hearts tonight. Change us eternally, radically, Lord, because... We came to this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, would with your heads, would you with your heads bowed? I, as your pastor, I, I'm under obligation to give you a res, an opportunity to respond to that message because there were, there were several calls that were put out there to believers, to Christians about sowing, not just with your words, but also with your life. About forsaking all and not loving this world or its trappings more than you love Jesus. And then, too, I, I feel, especially when our missionary guests come through and, and talk about being in a career or in a job that they think they're going to be at forever, and then God completely redirects their life and sends them to Brazil or missionaries to the deaf, like Jack Francis. There may be those in a career now, and you think this is what you're going to retire from. And all the while, God is knocking on your heart's door, wanting to redirect your life, and you are the answer to those people who are praying that God would send forth laborers in the harvest. That might be you. So I, I want to... I want to give this invitation. As our music begins to play tonight, I want to give this invitation. What would God, in any of those aspects, what would God be laying on your heart tonight? Are you sowing the seed where Brother Jim started? Are you sowing the seed like you ought to be sowing? Have you forsaken all in your heart when it comes to following, being a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Christ? They forsook all and followed him. And I, I agree with Brother Jim. I, I don't know that you can separate those two things. Or might you be one that God is stirring up and, and, and you've thought, that thought's entered your mind before. God may be calling me to be a missionary. And you, boy, that, that, you kick that thought out of there as quick as you can. But what if you're the answer to the prayer that we pray God Lord of the harvest, would you send forth more laborers? Let God have his way in your heart tonight. Would you do that? Thank you. You can look up 
you could look up this way. I, wasn't that good tonight? I, I mean, to hear what God's done over 37, 35 years, uh, and then also to be challenged like that from the Word of God. I, I'm so thankful that, that the Shaws could be here tonight, but more grateful for the Word of God that's been given to us. And I hope you'll do, uh, I hope you'll do what we ought to do every time we leave here. I hope you'll go home and think about that. Um, uh, Josh and Daniel and I, this, this week, we've, we've started uh, looking at biblical meditation together and what that means. And it means take what you've got from God's word and, and go out and chew on that. Chew on that. And so when we leave here tonight, consider Luke chapter 5 and Luke chapter 18. And, and he, he challenged us to, to go back and read that whole story about that rich young ruler. Read what Jesus said. And let's let God do his work. And just because the invitation closes and we pray and we dismiss and we're saying goodbye out the door, God's still working in your heart. I hope he is and working in my heart. And uh, I, I certainly appreciate, appreciate that tonight. And uh, I'm grateful for them. You pray for the Shaws. I, I wasn't sure if you were going to share what's coming up in the, in the next several months. Um, but as their ministry is going to take a, a, a dramatic change um, from what it looks like now, um, I, I'm interesting to, to talk. I'm interested to talk more about that. But I, uh, we've had other missionaries who, their support through this board or this church kind of ended or whatever. But you know, Dennis and Sue Anderson. Every once in a while, they're they're back in Africa, and uh, we help them. In fact, they have a trip this month, I believe, that they're going. Uh, we're helping them with that, and and so pray for Jim and Rhonda as their uh, as their ministry changes, but. Their ministry also continues in Brazil, and what God has for them, and how uh, how we as as supporting churches can continue to be a part of that work. I think that's uh, I think that's ongoing. Um, pray for them. Pray for their family. Would you? It's been good to be in God's house today, and I hope you've enjoyed being here. Thank you for coming back tonight. I really hope you'll come meet the Shaws if you haven't. Um, you've got questions about their ministry or, or about Brazil or how you can go to Brazil uh, in their place. If they're not going to be there full time, you want to go, come talk to them. Um, but, but meet them tonight, and then they'll be, uh, they'll be heading back out tomorrow. And I, did you tell me you're going back to Brazil in November? Is that the goal? Um, so they've, they, they've just got a little bit of time left here. Uh, so pray for their return and, and, and things they have to accomplish from November until next March. Down, uh, down in a place where they've lived for 37 years. That's a, or 35. I keep saying 37, but I, that's just a long place or a long time to be in that place, and then to close that out and, and change change things. So pray for them, would you? Let's be dismissed in prayer tonight, and uh, and then let's go this week and see about where we're going to be sowing the seed that God's given to us. All right, brother Wes Blackstone, would you would you dismiss us in prayer? Amen. Amen.